Hi there, I'm Dr. Emily Porter. I'm a board certified emergency physician in Austin, Texas. I'm also married to a board certified emergency physician. We trained in New York City and together we have about 30 years of combined experience in emergency rooms across the country, including some very busy ones like New York City um, in 2009, 2010 when the swine flu epidemic happened. And right now we're in the middle of this coronavirus outbreak. And everyone is really confused because they don't understand why do why are the bars closing? Why can I why is everyone hoarding toilet paper? Why do I why is my gym closing? What does social distancing mean? What does flatten the curve mean? And isn't this just like the flu? Because why is why is everyone panicking now and they didn't panic before? And so I'm also happen to be um, the sister of Katie Porter, who's a representative in Congress from California, who about a week ago made national headlines for her whiteboard. She's famous for her numbers and drawing things out so that the people on the Hill who she questions can understand them. So I thought it kind of runs in the family and I'm going to show you on my whiteboard why doctors, governors, um, and other people around the country are concerned about coronavirus and why every American should be, and really everyone around the world should be. So numbers wise, in America, we have 331 million people. So the CDC is estimating that about 40 to 70 percent of them will get infected. Okay, so I'm definitely a glass is half full kind of person. So to make the numbers easy, I'm going to say that it's 150 million people. 150 million infected okay that's about 45 percent so on the lower end of that 40 to 70 percent so if 150 million people get infected you know 80 percent of them are going to be just fine they're going to say oh you're going to have a cold they're going to feel like they have a runny nose a cough um actually that's not much runny nose but a cough a fever um, they're going to feel like they have a cold or allergies and they're going to be just fine. They might not even get tested. They might not ever know that they had anything. They had a little fever, you know, no big deal. So 80% are fine. 20% of them are probably going to need to be hospitalized. And our country we know has, uh, we all say we have great health care, but the reality of it is, is that we have a very aging population. 14.5% of Americans are 65 and older. That's 47 million people are, are 65 and up and it's getting bigger and bigger every day with the baby boomers all aging. You've all heard that. So 20% of people will need hospital hospitalization. Italy has a big problem right now and they don't have enough hospital beds for people. Well, they have more hospital beds per capita in Italy than they have in America. So they have more hospitals, more doctors, more people to take care of all the sick people than we do in America. So 80% fine, 20% need a hospitalization. Five to 10% Of the, of the 150 million that get infected are going to need a ventilator. So a ventilator is also called a respirator. You've heard life support. That means you're going to take somebody, put a breathing tube in their trachea and help inflate their lungs. So what makes the novel, which means new, and this is a new strain of a virus, so coronaviruses have been around forever, colds and flu are coronaviruses, but this strain is very new to us and we're still learning about it. But what we know is that it primarily kills people by attacking their lungs and their heart. So if you look at an x-ray, um, which you've probably seen on TV or maybe in your doctor's office, it, it looks black. You see all the ribs and then black. What coronavirus does is it cause, causes something called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And what that looks like on that x-ray is a blizzard. Everything that was black that's air is now white. It's a snowstorm and it's fluid that fills the lungs. It also causes a cardiomyopathy, which is a problem with the heart. So the heart gets sick and it can't beat properly. So the only way to save those sick, sick people of the, of the 20%, you know, five to 10% of this 150 will need a ventilator to help them breathe, life support. What it does is it helps their lungs rest, it helps their heart rest, it gives their body time to heal because we don't have a cure for this virus, we don't have an antiviral drug that works and we don't have a vaccine. Hopefully we'll get one, but for now we don't have one. Um, get your flu vaccine if you haven't gotten one and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so five, let's say 5% of the people need ventilators. We're, again, glass is half full. So 5% of 150 million people 
is 7.5 million vents needed in America. If we, if people, these people get sick, the only way they're going to live is if we have a ventilator for them. So we need 7.5 million ventilators. So I start thinking, well, how many do we have in America? Like I'm in Texas, it's a big state. We've got a lot of big hospital systems. We probably have more than enough to take care of everybody. What's this flatten the curve business? They're blowing it out of proportion. So I looked it up and in Texas, we only have about 4,000. Um, and so America wide, we have about, they estimate between 72,000 and 120,000. So we're gonna round up because we're, again, we're optimistic and say, this is if, this is the number that they have in hospitals right now. If they pull all the ventilators out of storage, if they take all the ventilators out of the operating rooms, if they suspend all the elective surgeries, they pull, you know, and they take everybody who's currently on a ventilator because there are people, our hospitals are full. There's people that are, have had a heart attack or there's people that have, have the flu that are currently using ventilators or respirators. But let's say that they're completely empty. Then we have, and we pull all these ones out of storage, we have 120,000. We're gonna say we have 150,000. We're gonna say that the government finds a way to find 30,000 of them real quick and we have 150,000. So let's say we have 150,000 vent, vents available in the country, okay? If I were to give you a percentage of 0.02% of people could get a ventilator if they needed one, right? That doesn't sound that bad, but what if I told you that one in 50 people who need a ventilator can get one? What does that mean? That means that 49 people out of 50 are gonna die because we do not have the respirators and the ventilators to take care of them. That is scary. That should scare you. That, should, that scares me. That should scare everybody who can understand basic math, including my second grader, that one in 50 are bad odds. So what that also means is that the doctors have to choose who that one in 50 is. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if, if you had to say, oh, I'm sorry, you have had cancer before, so therefore you're not, you don't have a perfectly clean bill of health, so you're not worth saving. Can you imagine saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're 80, and I've got a 30-year-old that needs the ventilator. Making those choices, because that's what they're doing in Italy right now. They're having to decide, use ethics committees, and, and you, then you run into people bribing people, it's just, it's a disaster. Nobody wants to do that. You know when they do that? They do that in war, in mass casualty, when there's a big bomb that explodes. They teach us in our emergency medicine residencies about toe tags and, and wartime triage. And they give you tags. And there's a black tag and a green tag and a yellow tag and a red tag. And one of the questions is, how do you decide who gets what tag? And the black tags are all the people that aren't worth saving because, you know, half their body got blown off. You're probably not going to be able to save them in in a war field, but save the people that you can. And the mantra is the greatest good for the greatest number. And so unless you want this to happen, unless you want somebody to decide whether you're worth saving or your dad or your sister or your baby or your grandma is worth saving, you have to do your part to prevent us from having to make these decisions because we're heading there and we're heading there very, very quickly. So you've heard about flattening the curve. This is what that curve means. The number of cases of coronavirus, if we don't do anything besides just what we've been doing, if we follow other countries' leads, it's basically exponentially growing. It means it doubles to triples every two days or so, roughly. And this is the healthcare system capacity. That's a line. And what that means is this is all the personal protective gear that we have, the masks, the, the um, gloves that everyone ran out and bought so that now they don't have enough at my husband's hospital to protect him, um, all the N95 respirators, all the things, including the ventilators. This is our healthcare system capacity. And if we don't do anything without protective measures, we're gonna end up up here, above the ability to take care of everybody. What that means is that all these people and probably more die. They die because we don't have ventilators for them. And we have to start playing Russian roulette of who's gonna get saved. Is it gonna be the person who's been there the longest? Is it gonna be the, what if you have somebody on the vent? Who's gonna unplug your dad? My dad's 72, he's got a heart condition, he'll get unplugged. 
it's the reality that we face. It's awful, and I don't want it that it to come to that. So if we system capacity is, doctors are going to have to make those choices. Now, if we have protective measures, we're still going to have cases. This is a highly infectious virus. It's it's way more infectious than flu. Um, children don't die from it, so that's fortunate because flu kills a lot of babies every year. But children often don't get symptoms, and they spread it more than other people. Um, and so their danger to adults and especially to elderly adults so you know my my mom she doesn't get her see her grandbabies for a month or more we don't know um because we're practicing social distancing we're keeping people when we go out we're not going out of the house except to the grocery store to go for a walk those are the protective measures as well as hand sanitizer uh, washing your hands covering your cough you know sneezing into your elbow all those things that we as americans can do and I get it. Like, it stinks. My spring break got canceled. My kids are devastated. I don't want to homeschool children. I work full time. Um, I'm not saying it's ideal, but it's it's what has to be done. The experts are saying to prevent this from happening. Now, everyone's saying, what about flu? This is flu is so much worse. Flu kills so many more people. And yeah, flu, even though we have a vaccine, flu does affect a lot of people and flu kills a lot of people. But if you look at the overall mortality rates of this, um, which I guess I can write out. Um, if you look at the overall mortality rates of, of, of uh, coronavirus, okay, it really depends on the age. So it's about 0.2% of people under 39. So babies and young healthy people. Well, I just turned 40, so guess what? My mortality, it just doubled. 0.4% of people 40 to 49. Uh, upwards, 1.3% of people 50 to 59, that almost, that triples basically there, 3.6% um, for people 60 to 69, and now we're really starting to head into trouble, 8% for people 70 to 79, and then 14.8% for people 80 plus. And so flu, on the other hand, if you have age 65 plus, flu is about 0.83% for people over 65. Now we have 14.5% of our population is 65 plus, which means we have 47 million people. And so this, you know, you get to here, you have three times, this is three times, three times, this is uh, the flu, um, times the flu, I'm sorry, down here. This is about uh, 8 to 0.83 is roughly 10 times. And then here, this is like 17 times. So the, seven, the flu, it, the coronavirus is 17 times more lethal for somebody over 80 than the flu is. It's 10 times more lethal for somebody 70 to 79. It's three times more lethal for somebody 60 to 69 than the general flu is for people, if you're assuming a 0.83% mortality in the people 65 and over. So you should be more scared than you are with the flu. And I don't, I'm not saying you have to be happy about it. If you own a small business, if you like to go out to eat, if you like movies, there's a million reasons to be angry and unhappy and, and just think that this whole thing sucks because it does. But what really sucks is losing 47 million people. This is a kind of pandemic and a kind of death that we've never experienced in our lifetime. And I know that I need to be able to sleep tonight. I want my mother safe, I want my father safe, I want my children to have grandparents, I want my, anyone I know, I had cancer, you know, like did they decide that because I had melanoma when I was 21 that maybe I'm not worth saving? I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna have to make those decisions. So I'm washing my hands, I'm doing my part, and I'm also just listening to what I'm being told by the experts from the infectious disease experts from the, and the NIH and Dr. Fauci and our government and I really hope that you can too, because this is America. This is not about what religion you are, what race you are, what color, how much money you have. This is about everybody coming together for the common good that we want a future for our children. And it's two weeks, man. It's like two to four weeks. I'm, I'm reading some books, I'm baking with my children, and I'm just making the most of it. And I hope that if you care about anybody other than yourself, including especially these 47 million Americans, that you will also do the same and just not complain about it and just do it because it's what we got to do. Thank you.